So it's, a, it's pretty exciting to be back here today. Um, Manchester happened to be the, the city that introduced urban design to me. I did my uh, design thesis at a site about probably half a mile um, east of this site, um, Middlewood Locks, which, funny enough, I, I called back in the day naturally urban. And uh, there's a resonance in today's presentation that relates very much back to what I actually produced uh, many years ago. Um, and then I worked in Manchester for a number of years at Edor. So to come back here after a bit of a travelling journey around the world, it's, it's great to be here. So um, I'll get straight on to it, really. So today's presentation is broken down into two sections. There's the evolution of cities and essentially the challenges we're facing today. And then there's the revolution, the progressive ways of approaching and revitalising our places and cre creating more in, uh, resilient environments. So moving into evolution, it's very important to kind of look at the origins of our society, where it actually came from. Going back many, many years ago, um, our kind of society emerged from a nomadic existence. We wandered the earth and through that created trading routes, and those trading routes eventually created confluence of activity, and those confluences of activity created cities and centres. And uh, the origins of this meant that we created a far more informal, emergent process of growth. Fast forward to today, and we're looking at now 50,000 cities across the globe, with 29 megacities looking at populations over 10 million. So our cities have become major components of our, of our society. But it was the industrialization period in the early 1800s which radically transformed our approach and thinking to growth. We saw the agrarian society, um, where we looked at agriculture, shift to industrial society. And with that, we started to see a rapid population shift in our cities. Pre-1800, we saw 3% of people living in cities. Today, 50%. By 2050, 70%. percent 6.8 billion people living in cities. Our cities have essentially become the major habitat of the human. And so we need to start looking a lot more radically at how we respond to city growth. With this growth, and with this mass production, and with this kind of thriving for wealth, we've created a sheer divide in how we create our cities. We've created very much the urban and the natural component which are not working together. We've also created a separation between planning and community. We're planning for community, we're not actually planning with the community. And these two divergent approaches have created real problems that are critically seen today. If we carry on on this path, we're looking to project 60% of our land expected to be urbanised by 2030 is currently unbuilt. So that's huge um, eating into our environmental capital. We're also looking at present moment 1.5 Celsius temperature increase. And it's looking at almost hitting the 2 Celsius, which is a critical level of climate impact where we'll see some huge changes into our sea levels, water and ultimately uh, urban heat island effect. We're also seeing a um, an increase in frequency in storms. Hurricane Harvey seems, you know, it's a very present day issue and, and the kind of radical amount of water, 27 trillion gallons of water was deposited on that city area. So we're seeing some huge radical changes now in our environment and our cities haven't got the built in resilience to deal with it. And we're also seeing 400 parts per million of CO2, highest for 29 million years. We're essentially slowly suffocating ourselves through our development and not considering the environment. And what we've seen is our shift from the Holocene period into very much the Anthropocene, the age of the human, the period now where we have a direct impact on the actual society that we live in. At McGregor Coxall, we propose really a new approach, a new paradigm shift in planning, and it's called biourbanism. It's built on 10 systems. These systems all interrelate with each other, each one in balance with the other. We have the biosystems, which relate to the Greek word bios, which means life, and urbanism is the study of cities. Both combined can create more holistic outcomes in a place as long as you consider each one in its entirety and in balance. And that leads to revolution. This is the opportunity that we have and what we can produce in the future. There are three areas I want to focus on. There's the green city, the sponge city, and the smart city. And I thought... Being um, in Australia for the last six, seven years of my life, it would be perfectly apt to start with the green city, and that being um, primarily Australia. So Sydney base, if you look at Sydney as a focus, that's probably where I'll be looking at here. But the green city, if you look at Australia, 
it's beautiful landscape, it's large outback, it's you know pristine coastline, but you're seeing a huge population that live in urban areas, 89%. So the urban society in Australia is very important. With that, we're seeing increased obesity. 63.4% of Australians are obese, some of the highest percentages in the world. And that's costing the government $13.8 billion annual cost of physical activity. So their medical system is struggling to deal with the vast scale of this kind of obesity issue and the lack of activity built into our urban environments through sprawl. The solution, and it's widely known, is about creating healthy parks, open spaces, easy, equitable access for all. And that can improve the physical, mental and social health for everybody, all ages. Sydney in particular has 600,000 hectares of green infrastructure. And it's, a lot, it's this green infrastructure which is seen as a huge value in the future of their society, especially considering the population growth that is expected. So we were commissioned uh, by the New South, New South Wales government to um, look at what's called the Sydney Green Grid, a regional scale study looking across all the green infrastructure in the entire area and establishing a toolbox. The challenge is, and it, as, it, as it always is, our planning controls are completely out of date. 2.83 hectares per thousand people is the fixed rate of open space planning. The, the funny thing is, this is the origins of the British planning system. This is, an, uh, this is something that dates back to the 1920s. This, this, this figure is 100 years old. This was based on gymnastics and children's play, and yet we're still designing public open spaces on that ratio. So this study was about how can we transform our perspective and using open space planning tools and be a lot more responsive. And so to do that, it was a two-tiered approach. And what we looked at was essentially creating a guiding tool. This was regional. We weren't looking at the intricacies of each space. We were looking at it as a regional scale. How can we set a toolkit that can get the council districts to work in harmony and actually work in a balance so they all consistently create the same data that can actually all be used? This is shifting planning from a reactive standards approach to a proactive needs-based approach. To start with, it was looking at setting a set of criteria that looked at the needs-based solutions to the community. That's looking at the quality of the spaces. That's looking at the quantity, looking at the accessibility, looking at the diversity. This essential criteria was something for the council districts to actually use and apply, and therefore go down the approach of a needs-based solution. As part of the study as well, we wanted to make sure that the data use was essentially the same. So we did a huge GIS kind of overlay of each of these districts across the entire region, looking at their uh, ISO distance modelling, looking at how accessible these open spaces were. If we just zoom into one of them, this is a good example of what we were looking at as a 400 metre catchment, a 2 kilometre catchment and a 5 kilometre catchment. These aren't where these catchments aren't about radius and where the crow flies. These are actually about modelling the streets, understanding each of these barriers. You might live 30 metres from an open space, but it might take you 500 metres to get there. This study calculated that and identified through all these red zones where inadequate space was provided. By having this unanimous kind of holistic look at the open space plan across the entirety of Sydney, we then are also able to kind of create some high-level approaches and strategies to how do you actually rectify these spaces? How can you think bigger about the opportunities and tying all this green infrastructure? So we set a toolkit of urban strategies, and these obviously were very much simple for this presentation, but they were nuanced in a way that they gave people clear understanding of how to look at these different spaces within their uh, district. And then we looked at the typologies, and we created a whole array of typologies giving them an understanding of what type of spaces at various scales can be considered. This is not an endpoint. this is just the beginning. The idea is each of these council districts will continue on this path, identifying more and more typologies that they all can share and use. And it goes from the, the regional scale all the way down to the local scale. Essentially this goal of this project, and it will be implemented over many years, is about a set, creating that green grid, that interconnected network of spaces for all different habitats, for all different users and creating what you call a, a true green city. I want to then move to the sponge city and this is kind of flying us over to China. China is, a, is an interesting, um, very radically different place to Australia in a lot of ways. Things happen fast and also they have a very different approach to their urbanism. They've grown at an exponential rate. Within 20, 30 years you've seen huge 
huge growth. And with that growth comes a lot of repercussions. And the sponge city concept takes on board the large-scale approach to water. And in particular, it's, it's like in the UK, it's called SUDS. In Australia, it's called Water Sense of Urban Design. But think of SUDS and times it by a million, because that's the scale they're looking at. They're looking at reinvesting 5.9 billion RMB, which is roughly 700 million, um, just in the first couple of years and starting to get these pilot studies going. The reason being, 230 of the cities in 2013 are flooded. This is increasing every year. The urban realm is just completely saturated by water and there's lack of permeability. 80% of groundwater from major rivers is unsuitable for human contact. Pollution, water quality, again, an essential ingredient in creating life, yet it's polluted and it's in a poor condition. But as you know, the Chinese can do very well, they can shift their means very quickly, and they've got some very radical targets. 70% of water will be absorbed and reused in all their cities by 2030. 80% of their cities will meet sponge city objectives by 2030. So we're seeing huge targets, huge aspirations of what they can achieve. And this takes me to the next project, which is Lingang Bird Century. And this is a project that we've been working on, um, and it's in kind of, it'll be in construction phase over the next uh, few months. But the beauty of this project is, and it, it demonstrates the radical aspects to Chinese government, a site looked at reclaimed shoreline of Bohai Bay, so they decided to extend the land, and they filled it with earthworks from the local ro uh, road infrastructure to the left, and left it. And the developer bought it with the aspirations of no doubt creating a replication of the multiple towers uh, to the side of it. But during this time, the sponge city concepts came forward, the need for improvement of water and ecologies, and um, this developer, thinking he was sitting on a gold mine, ended up getting told by the government, you've got to make it into an ecological habitat. And the reason being is because this habitat had actually started to create bird species from all around the Australian, Asian, Pacific region. All the way from New Zealand, all the way up through to the, um, Canada and Alaska. This was actually the first area of habitat for uh, these birds to restore and re-inhabit re and actually rest. You have, you have 5 million migratory waders and shorebirds, 22 countries intersected on this site, 29 protected species, 55 migratory species, and up to 25,000 species visiting annually. A huge amount of um, habitat uh, restoration needed. So what we were looking at doing is how can we actually restore and actually just enhance the ha habitat and create it into an ecological engine. We proposed a 60 hectare wetland reserve and a 3,500 metre squared water pavilion to act as a tourist destination to educate and inform the local community on the values of nature. Bird preservation was a fundamental key part of this project. It looked at terrestrial habitat through an urban forest around the edge. We also looked at dual use open water zones so that it was actually creating a, a, an opportunity to cleanse and clean water but equally provide habitat. And we also did some minor amendments proposed, just allowing the existing wet wetlands, which are already currently there, to just be um, just slightly enhanced and improved. With that overlay was the water management. And that essentially the process was about cleaning the water to the, what would be the right-hand side of the screen and slowly filtering it through so that you're creating a cleansed environment. All the urban catchment around would actually be directed onto site, so again, it would be this natural ecosystem that's cleaning, cleansing, starting to uh, pro produce clearer water for the local river systems. And so what did this create? Well, this created probably what we say the first world's bird habitat, uh, the bird airport. And this has got a lot of press because of that, because it essentially is the first bird, ha uh, bird airport in the world. And here's a few images just to give you an idea, some wetland trails, lake loop walks, cycle circuits, forest walks. Again, it's, it's giving people in a very urban environment the opportunity to actually see the value of, of ecologies and, and systems. But importantly as well, it wasn't about humans um, kind of taking over the land. We were hiding the humans, we were making sure that they would never interact with the species too much. So the idea was giving them bird hides at specific locations so people can witness, but they wouldn't actually impose. And the last bit's the smart city, and the smart city very much relates to technology. We're seeing change happening 10 times faster now, 300 times the scale of what the Industrial Revolution was like, and technology is one of the key components to that. The Internet of Things is a major component in how we can start to create smarter systems in our cities. We can engage communities in a smarter patisserie program if we start to embed technological infrastructure into our cities. 
It's not about technology taking over, it's about technology informing, allowing us to learn, understand how these systems to start to work. 46.4 million people use smartphones. This is technology in the palm of your hand that you can directly communicate and contact. It also provides a, a, an indirect sense of understanding century where people are uh, moving around. So you can start to intelligently understand the uses of spaces. Looking at London, 89% of Londoners use digital technology regularly. And with that, we're starting to see this trend that if we can connect better with smarter phones, we can create smarter communities. It's not again about dominating, it's about allowing the communities to have access. The traditional means of engagement where we just meet people in workshops is starting to become not redundant, but a secondary component. If you can connect with a larger base through um, social media or smarter software, you can start to create a better outcome. And that leads to this, the last project, which is a recent London project we've been doing called High Croydon. And this was essentially looking at the stretch of street between West Croydon Station and East Croydon Station. The role was about replication, understanding how you can create technology built into a street infrastructure. Our idea was very simple. We proposed six modular pieces, each composed in a way that would interrelate with each other. The best way to describe it is think Lego. They can be constructed in any way, in any manner, for any place. So let's look at a simple um, option. Start with a, a tree planter. If you interconnect it, you can create a lounger, a desk, a standing table, a stool, a bench, a planter, or a lounge space. A very simple exercise in just demonstrating how it all com is compatible. But what you're creating is a habitable space that is a temporary permanent solution that is built on responding to the streetscape and allowing communities to use spaces. Let's move into the detail and look at actually at what these components are constructed of. So perforated edge steel um, is sitting, be, uh, sitting on top of the dot matrix LED. That dot matrix LED again is programmed and linked very much to the, the smart software. The steel folded cladding as well is intersected with wood or it could be a grass plant or it could be a self-watering planter. The self-watering planter again is something that only needs to be maintained once a week because it's got a wicker bed and it retains water. Filtration fans are inserted, which can start to improve air pollution. It's proven that air filtration fans built into actual natural um, elements can radically improve air pollution. So we're seeing this as an opportunity to create sustainable um, air ecologies in the actual um, street. But moving out to scale, when you take the, the modular pieces and you take the modular elements, you can create a whole myriad of options and scenarios in these public spaces. Resting on Tamworth Road, play, Road playing on North End, outdoor dining on high, high Street. Essentially, we're creating an adaptable way of reusing spaces that aren't working in current streets. A core fo focus is about the community-driven approach, and that's through actually smart technology. Augmented reality will allow the community to have a direct say in the actual outcome. You basically put the pieces in the software and let the community play, and through a voting system, you can start to actually get community empowerment in the street. A habitable, adaptable furniture system as well can arrange to various programs, various scenarios. We create self-sustaining breathing botanic gardens that actually filters air, and we look at a live data response to tactical urbanism. Each of these is built in with the idea of mapping and understanding how people use spaces. Intelligence is underpinning the actual outcome of all these scenarios, so that you're essentially we are learning from each of these interventions and understanding what works. This then can actually inform the future redevelopment of sites um, in the future. And there's an interactive dynamic lighting and wayfinding system built in. Again, interacted through messaging. People can message through the smartphone capabilities. They can change colours. Getting people to engage with the streetscape through technology is a real opportunity. So in summary, I've provided you a bit of an overview from a regional scale, city scale, to the street scale. And I've looked at green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, and smart infrastructure. But the commonality in all of these is about adaptation and responding to needs of those areas. We need to start looking more open and adaptive, not complex and non-adaptive solutions to places. Start thinking more intelligently and more responsive to those areas. So in the midst of this urban revolution, there's an opportunity to kind of harness the power of the community and really value the environmental systems in our, in our cities. And through that, we'll be able to create happy, harmonious, and ultimately healthy environments for everyone to love. Cheers. Thank you.